Don't let my love grow cold. Don't let my love grow cold. I'm calling out like the fire again. Don't let my vision die. I'm calling out like the fire again. You know. Don't let I just speak for myself, but I know I need that. I need that on a daily basis, Lord. That song is a prayer for me. Lord, because it is so easy in this world to get distracted. And Father, I want my relationship with you, my fire to burn bright, passionate, that you would always be my first love. And I know, Lord, that my brothers and sisters echo that in their hearts as well. So, Lord, may your spirit come upon us in a powerful way today. Draw us to yourself. May you be our portion and delight, the desire of our heart, Lord, to be with you and commune with you in every way. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Standing for the song. Our Father everlasting, the all creating one, God Almighty, through your whole. Spirit conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. 
in that name that anybody's saved. Lord, it's in that name that we have life, that we have breath, that we have grace and love and mercy, Lord. And so, Father, we just thank you for that name and the position that we have in you. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus. You may be seated. place 
place I'd rather be than in your arms above. In your arms above, holding me still, holding me near. In your arms above, I sing a simple song. Sing a simple song of love to my Savior, to my Jesus. I'm grateful for the things you've done, yes, and loving Savior, oh precious Jesus. My heart is glad. That you call me your own. There's no place I'd rather be than in your arms of love. Than in your arms of love. Holding me still. arms in the universe and we're secure Lord you will never ever leave us or forsake us but sometimes Lord our hearts wander we all know how that is and Lord we have to commit ourselves to your lordship as our pastor teaches us all the time, the root of every problem is it's a, it's a lordship problem. Whether it be trusting you, whether it be our, our marriages, whatever it is, Lord, it's a lordship. And so, Father, we just pray that you would rule and reign in our hearts. Lord, we know that we can't ever taken from your arms, but Lord, we can definitely miss out on the blessings of being in the center of your will. So Lord, as we sing this song, Lord, may it just be our prayer to you. Over all the earth, sunset sky but my one request Lord my only aim is that you reign in me again Lord reign in me reign in your power over all my dreams in my darkest hour you are
Father, there is part of the lyric of that song that every time we sing through it, that old hymn, it speaks to my heart. For I am His and He is mine. Bought with the blood, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we know from our Bible theology, from our doctrine, that once that event occurs, once we are born from above, born again by the Spirit of the living God, that that will never stop being. I am His. He is mine. And I have been bought, redeemed and ransomed, washed and forgiven by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And we thank you for that this morning. I want to pray for the many that are recovering, Lord, from surgery. We think of Gary and Terry and Lori and Chuck and Dennis, Lord. We pray that their bodies would just heal up. We think of Sherry Marinvich, Lord, as she's, you know, 
going through the treatment for cancer, Lord, and just some very serious things going on in the fellowship with health issues. And we want to lift those things to you this morning. We want to thank you, Father, that Susan is here, that, that Lord, uh, they can't seem to find anything wrong with her heart. Uh, of course they wouldn't, Lord. Her heart belongs to you. How would they find anything wrong with it? But, Father, we just pray for the physical needs of the body. We pray for those that are struggling, you know, with the flu and cold that's going around. Many aren't here this morning. A number have called in. You know, my, my son-in-law and daughter and, and grandkids are in that group today, and we want to lift them before you as well as John Kirksey. Lord, he's really had a struggle with it and has contracted double pneumonia, and Lord is still trying to recover from that. We just lift him before you. And every other need represented here this morning, whatever it might be, financial, physical, marital, emotional, spiritual, you know, Lord, you know what the need is. And Lord, I especially want to pray as, you know, I got to get away and spend a night up in the mountains just praying and, and thinking about things and meditating on things and, and being able to graze in some of the areas of Scripture that I like to graze in, you know, not areas that I have to teach, but just, you know, areas that just speak to my heart. One of the things that just hit me in that time, Father, is that, that as we're moving toward the last of the last days, that final moment when you're going to remove your church and you're going to deal with the wicked, Father, Lord, the spiritual warfare, Paul told us that it would increase exponentially, that these would be perilous times and seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, Lord, just a real difficult time to navigate through, hated of all nations for your namesake. And Lord, I just pray for every person here because, you know, what came to my mind as I was just there with you, Father, in prayer is that the devil will find whatever the chink is in our armor, whatever the weakness is in our flesh, and he's going to try to exploit it. He's going to try to take advantage of us in it. And Lord, I pray this morning for the strength of the Holy Spirit for my brothers and my sisters in Christ. Lord, I pray that their faith would be strong, that their resolve would be sure, that they would be filled with your Spirit and standing firmly upon the authority of your Word. And Lord, that you would weld up any chink in their armor, that you would shut it, Lord, so that they may have no access to them. Put a hedge of thorn about them, Father. Give your angels charge over them concerning everything that they go through, Lord. Keep our hearts and our minds stayed on you, Father, we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus, we ask. And all God's kids would say, Amen. Well, you know the drill. Let's spend a few moments greeting one another before you settle into your spot this morning. Hey, let's turn on our Bibles. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. That's how far we've come. That's where we'll pick up this morning. We're going to do all 13 verses of them. We're going to get a whole chapter in one setting. Then we're going to have communion because there's a single thought in it. But it's a very important thought. And so as we look at it this morning, I would just pray, and we're going to do that in a few moments, that the Holy Spirit would just speak to you. The theme of chapter 8, although he's going to begin to answer questions about meat offered to idols, really the, the theme of the, of the teaching will be being others-centered. Boy, has there ever needed to be a message on being others-centered. Amen? Father, we thank you this morning for your word, and as we look at it, as we teach through it, as we read it, Lord, we would pray that the Holy Spirit would take the teaching of Paul as we give commentary on it, Father, and speak to our hearts. And Lord, we know that the benefit of studying your word is never just in the instruction, it's in the application. And so we don't want to just be hearers of the word, we want to be doers. And I think, Lord, one of the most difficult things for us as Christians to do. But one of the most uh, greatest evidences of our Christian faith is to die to ourselves, to serve others, to be a servant, to be others-centered and not self-centered. So, Lord, just speak to our hearts this morning. We would pray in the mighty name of Jesus, we would ask. And all God's kids would say, Amen. Amen. Paul is still in the vein of answering questions. If you remember back in chapter 7, he opens up that section by saying that, he, that he's now answering the things that they wrote 
unto him concerning. You know, as we looked at chapter 7, it was about marriage and divorce and widows and sexual relationships and marriage as Christians. Is it more important to be or more proper to be or more holy to be celibate or abstinent or, you know, what's all that about? And he answered those things, I think, in a very masterful way. Very difficult chapter to walk through because there's no area of your life the Bible doesn't deal with, and so we dealt with that. But now as we come to chapter 8, there was a controversy going on in Corinth because in Corinth there were temples to idols. And part of the worship of these idols was that you would bring meat as an offering and you would sacrifice those things to whatever God it was that you were sacrificing to, and then the meat was taken, butchered, and sold. They would have restaurants sometimes at these, uh, these places of idol worship, or they would have meat markets to raise money. And the controversy arises now as the Corinthian Christians are asking Paul, hey, listen, if you eat meat that's been offered to an idol, can you become demon-possessed? If you eat meat that's offered to an idol, is it a sin against God? If you eat meat offered to an idol, is there something wrong with that? And the reason they're asking, <laughs> you know, because they're very frugal there in Corinth, is that you could go and buy the meat up that's been offered to an idol at a cut rate. You could go up there and get a ribeye a lot cheaper than you could go down to the marketplace and buy a ribeye in the open markets. So a lot of the Corinthian Christians, and listen, meat was a luxury in those days. A lot of them, you know, because, you know, being very frugal, being on a budget, uh, the Christians would go up and they would buy the meat that's been offered to an idol at a cut rate, come home, cook it, and eat it. And some of the other Christians were saying, what are you doing? Don't you know that's been offered to an idol? Don't you understand that there's some kind of demonic thing going on with that meat? And, and man, you could get demon-possessed if you eat that meat. And so this controversy is going on in Corinth. They write Paul and say, okay, what about it? And here's what Paul says in 13 verses, chapter 8. But I will tell you, the theme is not about meat and idols. He uses that to segue into a very important issue in the Christian faith. And that is, you need to be others-centered. You know, we're living in a culture, we're living in a day, and we're living in a time where there seems to be this, this overwhelming thought that we have rights today. Uh, that, you know, there are certain things that should come our way and that we should be able to stand on those things. You know, we, we have, all of, you know, have all of these privileges. We have all these rights. And how dare anybody? We're living in a culture of entitlement. Would you say amen? We're entitled. And listen, the Christian knows nothing of that. The Bible knows nothing of that. Listen, the Bible says that you are bought with a price. You are not your own. You have become the servant of Jesus Christ. You have become his slave, actually. In fact, Jesus said, unless a man or a woman is willing to deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me, they cannot be my disciple. When you came to the Christian faith, when you bowed your heart's knee to the lordship of Jesus Christ, that's exactly what happened. You were born from above. The spirit of the living God entered into you and you were born again. You once remained dead and dormant as far as the spiritual things go, but now that you're born again, God calls you to a life of serving Him. And in the process, listen carefully, of serving Him, you serve one another. It's God first, others second, and you come in last, you're third. This is what God is calling us to. No, you don't have any rights anymore. You are crucified with Christ, nevertheless you live, but it's not you any longer. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's why Jesus would say in Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? That's why that particular lyric in the song that we just sang um, there was so important to me. It's because it, it, it talks about relationship. I am yours, 
you're mine. I'm bought with the precious blood of Christ. And that's the reality in the Christian walk. And because you're bought with a price and you're not your own, then you have to become subservient to the Father, subservient to His commandments. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, they follow no other. In fact, they that love me keep my commandments. And so as you're walking in faith, you're walking in obedience because to obey is better than sacrifice, to hearken more than the fat of rams. And part of that obedience is dying to self. Serving the Lord and serving others. And so this question arose here in Corinth. It's, it's posed to Paul here in chapter 8, and it says this, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. And we have uh, knowledge, but knowledge puffs up and love Builds up. There's a play on words there in the Greek. Uh, your King James Bible or New King James may, may say edify, but it's really a play on words. Knowledge puffs up, love builds up. And then he's going to go through and say that we know that an idol is nothing. In fact, let's read it. Verse 2. And if any man think that he knows anything, he knows nothing as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. As concerning, therefore, eating those things which are offered to, uh, offered in sacrifice to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in this world, and there is none other God but one. How do they know that? From the prophet Isaiah. When the nation of Israel had gotten caught up in idolatry, God sends the prophet Isaiah, and he goes right to the root of the matter as far as idols are concerned. In fact, you know, in chapter 44 of Isaiah, in fact, he starts in chapter 41, and he, he begins to work all the way through chapter 44 on how ridiculous idol worship is. But as he comes to chapter 44 and verse 6, he makes a statement. They'll put it on the screen if you don't want to turn there. Listen carefully. This is why they know that an idol is nothing. Paul's going to set that thing aside first. He's going to deal with meat offered to idols. He's going to talk about uh, that an idol is nothing and God is everything. But then he's going to address the prime issue here, the primary issue, the paramount issue is being other-centered. But here's what it says in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Now, we know that an idol is nothing. We know there's one God, the one true and living God creator of heaven and earth. And listen, there are no other gods. There is none beside him. There is none like him. He is the only one. And Isaiah makes that very clear. But then as he moves into verse 14, he says this now. Men, they go out and they hew down trees, cedar trees. Uh, they take the cypress and the oak, and which they strengthen for themselves among the trees of the forest, they plant the ash, and the rain doth nourish it. What Isaiah is saying is, you go out to the forest and you cut down a tree that, listen, you may have planted, but it only grew because God nourished it, because God sent rain upon it. But you cut down that tree, and then you take that tree, and you use it first to burn. He says, you take it and you warm yourself. Man, you, you chop it up, and, like we do around here, you split it, and then when the cold weather comes, you put it in your fireplace, you put it in your wood-burning stove, you burn that wood of that cedar or oak or ash that you have cut down, and it warms you. It warms your house. Then he says the second thing you do with it uh, is that you take it and you kindle a fire in your stove and you bake bread with it. And then what's left over, you take and you make a god and you worship a graven image and you fall down before it. See how ridiculous Isaiah makes it look? You take a tree, you make firewood out of it, you make wood for your cooking out of it, then you carve some of it, and you say at last, oh, I am warmed, and uh, I have seen the fire. And then he moves into verse 19, and he says this, listen carefully, and none considers in his heart, neither is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I have burned part of it, in the fire, yea, also I baked bread with the coals thereof, I have roasted flesh, I have eaten it, and shall I make the residue thereof an abomination 
Listen how ridiculous this is. Shall I fall down at the stalk of a tree? Should I worship something that neither has ears to hear, that has eyes to see? You know, they would make these gods and you would have to put them in a cart and haul them around. Rebecca stole some gods. Now, you, it's not much of a god if it can be stolen. You make it out of wood, it doesn't see, it doesn't hear. And so here Paul is saying, we know, we have knowledge, we have understanding, we have understanding from the scripture, we have spiritual understanding that there, there is no God but the true and living God. And idols are nothing. They, they're not alive, they don't live, they can't hear, they can't see, they can do nothing. They're a creation of man's hands. As man goes out into the forest and cuts down a tree, he brings it home, he, he warms himself with it, he cooks his meals with it, he bakes his bread with it, and with the, what's left over, he whittles out a god while he's setting around the fire, and then he bows down and worships it. How foolish that is. And so there is no God but one. We, we know that. We have that knowledge, but listen carefully to what he says. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. A.W. Tozier says there are two things that make a man ignorant. First of all, too little knowledge, but secondly, too much knowledge. I think it should be said there are two things that make a man ignorant. Too much knowledge of himself and too little knowledge of God. Here he's making a statement that knowledge, if you think you know something, you know nothing, as you ought to know, Paul would say, because your knowledge, your prideful understanding of certain things can puff you up. You can say to the weaker Christian, and this is what was going on in Corinth, hey, an idol is nothing, man. And I'm going to go up there and buy the cheaper meat because I know that an idol is nothing. I'm going to bring my ribeye back down. I'm going to cook it and eat it. And your weaker brother is freaking out because he doesn't have that knowledge. He doesn't, listen, he, he thinks that somehow that meat is tainted because it's been offered to an idol. And he's stumbled by the fact that you're eating it. And your weaker brother is going to say in a few moments is going to perish because he, he's, he's going to have difficulty in what you are doing. In fact, it may even embolden him, Paul is going to say, to go to the same place and eat meat. And when he buys that meat and eats it, he may feel like he is defiled. He may defile his own conscience because he's looking to what you are doing because you're claiming to have knowledge and he doesn't. Now listen, as we walk through this section, how important this is, and then we're going to bring some verses into it that describe the principle that's contained here. Verse 4. As concerning, therefore, those things that are offered unto sacrifice, we know that an idol is nothing. It's nothing in this world, and that there is none other but one God. For though there be many that are called gods, and in that day they had a prolifera of them, you remember as Paul is moving through Athens and he says, man, I see you're quite religious. You literally have a statue to every god that's represented in the plethora of Greek mythology. They're all here. In fact, you are so religious, you have one final statue over here, the statue to the unknown god, so that you'd have all your bases covered. In fact, in Rome at that time, they had put forth a decree that if anybody introduces another God, he is to be put to death because we have too many. We, you know, we put the capstone on it when we said, hey, listen, we've got the statue over here to the unknown God, and that covers all the rest that we may not know because we don't want to displease any of the gods. We, we know that these idols are nothing. But there's only one true and living God. Verse 5 says, for, for though there be many gods, those that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, and as there are gods many and lords many, but to us who are in the faith, but to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we in him, how be it, here's the rub, there is not in every man that knowledge. We are mature in the faith. We who have studied through the Bible, 
we have grown in our faith where we're no longer drinking the milk of the word, we're eating the meat of the word, there are certain things that we know. There are certain things we understand. There's a maturity that's come to us, but in the body of Christ, there could be those that don't have that knowledge yet. They are babes in Christ. They're still drinking milk, and they're not eating meat. They're immature. They're in the faith, but they are immature in the faith. And here is what Paul is going to say. He's going to say that it is the responsibility, listen to me this morning, it is the responsibility of the mature Christian to watch out for the conscience and the faith of the immature Christian. You may have knowledge this morning that an idol is nothing, and you know what? You would be right. Idols are nothing. There's only one God, true and living, creator of heaven and earth. And you would be right about that. But there are people that are coming to faith in Jesus Christ as they come into the body of Christ may not have that knowledge and some of the weird superstitions of the world still may be freaking them out. That's what was going on in Corinth. And Paul is saying that, listen, it's not your conscience that matters. It's the conscience of the weaker Christian that you need to guard, you need to protect. Uh, let me give you a few examples. Um, as we, we walk through this, I want to give you a few examples, and I pray that you don't get offended, but there are things that you can do because you think it's a liberty, because you have faith that it's not a particular sin. It can appear to be a sin, but it's not a sin, but you can cause your brother to stumble. This is what Paul is going to say, and when you cause your brother to stumble, you're going to sin against Christ. How be it, listen, there is not everyone that has this knowledge. For some with conscience of an idol, unto this very hour they would eat that thing offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak would be defiled. You see, they don't know that an idol is nothing. And it would hurt them, it would cripple them, it would, uh, it would diminish their faith, it would have a, a negative result upon their conscience. Because the Bible says, listen, if you can't do something in faith, then it's sin. Everything that we do, listen guys, listen gals, listen gang, everything you do, every place you go, everything you handle, everything you partake in, your conscience needs to be clear and clean on that. Amen? Anything that's not a faith. Now the Bible is very clear and very replete on the things the Bible calls sin. Sexual immorality is sin. Uh, materialism, sin. When you put those things above God. Pride, sin. Drunkenness. There's a whole list Paul gives twice of things we shouldn't be doing. Murder, drunkenness, fornication, sexual immorality. All those things we know from the Bible are sin. But the things the Bible doesn't label as sin, there are these, what some have called as gray areas. Some have said they're liberties in the Christian faith. One of them is before us this morning. Can you eat meat offered to an idol or not? Not real clear. You have to make sure that whatever you do, your conscience is not violated in that. I would say to you this morning, listen, if God has convicted you about chewing gum, no, seriously, I'm, I'm used to something, to but if God has convicted you and said, I don't want you chewing gum anymore, then for you, that would be a sin because the issue is not gum, the issue is obedience. The issue is the lordship of Jesus Christ. Every difficulty we're going to have in this life will always be associated with the Lordship of Jesus Christ. What is God saying to you? Now, these weaker brothers that Paul is talking about here, you know, their conscience is defiled. They're saying, man, if I eat that meat, now my brother's eating that meat, and, and I know he's very mature. I saw Pastor Mike. I saw Pastor Todd gnawing down on one of those prime ribs or one of those, you know, T-bones. I saw him eating it, and I, I watched, and they walked up, and they bought it from an, from an idol temple. What were they thinking? What were they doing? How could they defile themselves that way and then stand before us and teach God's word? Man, you know, because their conscience is, and then they say, well, if Pastor Mike can do it, if Pastor Todd can do it, if Max or Jim or Gary, well, Gary, but Max or Jim, <laughs> Gary can do it, then I guess I can, and they eat not in faith, their conscience 
is wounded by it, and it becomes sin to them. And many Christians do that, and they claim they're right because it's my liberty. It's my liberty. You see, I know that having a glass of wine is not a sin. I'm mature in my faith. I know having a beer is not a sin. I'm mature in my faith. I know drunkenness is a sin. So I'm going to have my wine and I'm going to have my beer. And then you have a weaker Christian who says, who comes out of the world, gets saved, who was an alcoholic, that sees Pastor Mike drinking a glass of wine. No, he won't. He'll never see Pastor Mike drinking a glass of wine. But if they were to see me in a restaurant doing that, then their weaker conscience wouldn't be emboldened. Well, Pastor Mike is doing it. It must be okay. And then they fall back into drunkenness. This is the idea here. You see, today in our society, alcoholism is an epidemic. There are women being beaten today as we speak by an alcoholic husband. In fact, Barna's research says there are men being beaten today by alcoholic wives. Can you wrap your hands around that one? People will be murdered on the highway today because somebody thought it was their privilege and right to drink until they were drunk and get behind the steering wheel and will kill families today. Young children, moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas will be killed on the highway today because of alcohol. Listen, it's epidemic in our society. And if we love people, even though we may have the faith to say, I'm okay with it, if it hurts somebody else, it becomes a sin. This is what Paul's going to say, and he's going to use me to prove this point. He said, how be it not everyone has this knowledge? And the weaker brother, he's emboldened to participate because he sees you doing it. Then he says in verse 8, But meat commendeth, not, commendeth us not to the Lord, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat are we the worse. But, listen to what he says, Take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to them that are weak. You see, the Bible calls us to be others-centered, to live our life not by just the liberties of our own life, the maturity of our own life, but to think about the weaker brother in the faith, how it would affect them, uh, how those things um, you know, might come their way and, and, and have some kind of a negative effect upon them. We really have to learn to serve one another. In fact, I, I, I want to read a few verses to you um, that to really bring this home. Um, Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 says this. Listen carefully. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Now, we're not under the law anymore. We're not under the dietary law anymore. We're not under uh, the ceremonial law anymore. We're still under the moral law, the Ten Commandments. But were there some of those things that Israel was involved in in a form of worship that we're no longer under because we find in Colossians it says, you know, don't let anybody put you under these bondages again of feast days and festival days and Sabbath days and drink not, you know, taste not, touch not. Those things have been done away with. So we are called to a liberty, a freedom to serve the Lord. But here, Paul writing to the church of Galatia says, listen, don't use that liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. I can't tell you how many people I've had in my office that want to come in and argue whether it's right to drink or not. And I find if you're going to argue over that point, that you already have a problem with it. Because the Bible is calling us to lay certain things down that may offend or affect other Christians in a negative way. Listen to what he says back in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We went through this section. Verse 12 says this, All things are lawful unto me, but not all things are expedient. They don't have a benefit. All things are lawful for me, but I will be brought under the power of nothing. Nothing will own me but Jesus Christ. I'm his servant. Now, for me as a pastor, it's wrong to drink. There is a prohibition in the Scripture. When you look under the, uh, uh, the list that Paul gives to Timothy and to Titus, 
the description of what a minister has to look like and how he has to live like, the qualifications of being a pastor. One of them is he's not to have any alcohol. He has to be clear-minded at all times, any time of the day, any time of the night, Whenever the Lord calls on him to go serve, he's got to be ready to go. It says among the deacons, they can have a little. I don't understand that, but they can have a little. That's their liberty. We also know from the scripture that drunkenness is a sin, but a beer or a glass of wine, I can't say is, because the scripture doesn't say it is. But it will become one. If you exercise that liberty and you cause somebody else to stumble with it. True story. D.L. Moody finally crossed the Atlantic Ocean. His desire was to meet Charles Haddon Spurgeon. You have the great American evangelist, D.L. Moody. I mean, at the turn of the century, probably led more people to the Lord than any other evangelist. And he wants to go meet the great Bible expositor, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And so the appointment was set, the time was given, he arrives at Spurgeon's office there. When he opens the door, Spurgeon is sitting behind his desk and he's smoking a cigar. D.L. Moody freaks out. He said, what in the world are you doing? Because in D.L. Moody's mind, smoking was a sin. And he begins to rail on D.L. Moody for smoking a cigar. How in the world are you so anointed in teaching the Word of God? How can you be so used of God and live such a sinful way? Man, what is wrong with you? And D, you know, D.L. Moody is standing there, and, and he's a rather large man. Spurgeon takes a puff of his cigar and says, I can't find in the Bible where smoking a cigar is sin, but I can see clearly where gluttony is a sin. <laughs> now here are two mature men who meet. And one is offended by something. You know, later on, that ground on Charles Haddon Spurgeon, and the fact Finally, the particular brand of cigar that he smoked, the company came and said, we want to use you for advertisement. Do you know he was so convicted he stopped smoking cigars? He said, because it has offended my brother. I have faith that there's no sin in it. But if it would cause me to have broken fellowship with D.L. Moody, if it would cause me to stumble anybody, if they want to use me as a means of advertisement for this, I wouldn't do it. And he gave up his liberty for the benefit of the weaker Christian. If you go to Africa today and we minister there in Uganda, if you smoke a cigarette, they will say you're not a Christian because Christians don't smoke cigarettes. If you drink a beer in Africa and somebody sees you a beer, you're not a Christian. That's their cultural mindset. You go to Germany and they do both. Christians go to the pubs and they drink beer. And, and fellowship. So listen, what he's saying is drunkenness is a sin, but there are some liberties that we can have. But we have to be careful how we exercise these liberties, that we don't stumble somebody else. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to them that are weak. Now, here's what, and this is my, what I'm telling you, honestly, this is one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, the unimaginable descent of Christ. Listen to these words again this morning as we look at them. Here, Paul writing to the church of Philippi says this, is there any therefore consolation in Christ? They're rhetorical questions. Have you received anything from Christ? Really? How about forgiveness of sin? How about grace and mercy? How about eternal life? Is there any consolation in Christ? Is there any comfort of love? Have you ever had the Holy Spirit when you're going through a really difficult time just wrap its arms around you and love on you? 
and comfort you. Is there any comfort, any fellowship of the Spirit? Man, I'm going to tell you, Friday night, the Holy Spirit was all over me. I'm sitting out by my little campfire. I found a new campsite where you guys don't know. And I actually found a campsite that has a concrete slab. I just rolled my camper right up on it, pulled out my propane fire pit, and I'm sitting there with my Bible open and just in fellowship with the Lord. God just speaking to me. Any bowels of mercy or compassion? Paul would say, fulfill ye my joy be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of wine, one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowness of mind. And here it is. Let each esteem others better, better than themselves. Look not every man on his own thing. Say, I'm entitled. No, 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 you're not. Not as a Christian, you're not. I have rights. No, you don't. You have responsibilities. Here he would say, look not every man on his own thing, but every man also on the things of others. Others-centered. And a truly mature Christian who is others-centered, one who is filled with the Holy Spirit, who is walking in fellowship with the Father, would never do anything that would stumble a weaker brother. Your heart, your passion, your goal, your desire would be to build that one up. Knowledge puffs up, and all through knowledge, you can exercise your liberties. You can demand your rights. You can say that you, you, you know what, you have entitlements to the destruction of a weaker brother. And the Bible says, listen, if you've received anything from Christ, be like-minded, be other-centered. In fact, he goes on as he moves into verse 5 in that passage, and what he tells us is Christ is our example, and this is what it looks like with Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was found in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, listen carefully, and he took upon himself the form of a servant, a slave. And was made in the likeness of men, and being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Listen, Jesus came for our benefit. He set aside all reputation, honor, privilege, and rights. He took on the form of a servant, and he served us. Even when it cost him everything, he served us. And that's our example. Listen, gang, guys and gals, that's our example this morning, that we should be willing to serve others even if it costs us something. We should be willing to lay aside our liberties for the benefit of the weaker brother. And if it would stumble my weaker brother for me to have a glass of wine or a beer, then set it aside and drink iced tea, man. Raspberry iced tea is better anyway for you. Get the unsweetened kind. Don't get the stuff with aspartame in it. That's bad. It's better for you. If I lived in a culture that would stumble somebody spiritually to eat meat, I wouldn't eat meat. Because when Paul talks about it back in chapter 6, he says, all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. All things are lawful, but not all things benefit. He moves in, he says, meat for the belly and belly for the meat, but the Lord's going to destroy both of those. They're not going to pass into eternity. They're not eternal. Meat and the belly are not eternal. But what is eternal is the soul and the spirit, the faith of the weaker brother. Let me move into another area, not just with alcohol. But let's say you have a problem murmuring and complaining. Oh, you mean nothing about it, man. It's just become a habit in your life as a Christian. And sometimes that can happen where you begin to murmur and complain about your job or you murmur and complain about your wife or you murmur and complain about your husband. And maybe there's a person who just comes to the faith. Man, they're brand new. And they're struggling with some things, real things in their marriage. Their marriage is about to fall apart. And here you come murmuring about yours and you embolden that person 
you put a negativity in that person and maybe they divorce because of your murmuring, which you would never do because you're, you know the divorce, that's never going to happen in your marriage, but you just are a complainer. The Bible calls that sin. Can I say that this morning? Because there's a lot of murmuring that goes on in the body of Christ that's just not right. Can you say amen? It's getting deep, isn't it? It's just not right. Be thankful in all things. This is the will of God concerning you in Christ Jesus. Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth, but only that which ministers grace builds up and edifies the listener. You, through your words, even as a mature Christian, because you know that you would never divorce your wife, you've grown past that. But if you begin to murmur and complain, a weaker brother may not have grown past that. And you may embold that person to so disdain their husband or their wife to the degree of divorce, and you've done it with your lips. Whew, getting quiet in here. Paul would say, but take heed. Take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which has knowledge set at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him that is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to an idol? Yes, they will be. You are an example. Listen, you're an epistle read of all men. People are watching you. My greatest fear is that somebody would stumble into faith by watching me. You know, I, I've told you, man, my chink, everybody has a chink in their armor, and I was praying for you guys' chinks in your armor when I was up Friday night. I was going through the, you know, the audience, and I was just praying for all of you guys because we all have chinks in our armor. And my chink is traffic, and you know that. I've confessed it. And I told you about the time when I first moved up here. I was coming up Highway 49. That's before they widened all those sections. And I was in this traffic, and it was just bumper to bumper. And some lady was just tailgating me. I mean, you know what? I couldn't even read her license plate. She was so close. And I'm having a bad day. And finally, we got to the one passing lane. And, and, she, and I, so I went, uh, she went around to pass me. And I remember waving at her with my fist. And she went to the church, still does. I waved it, you know, like, what's wrong with you? And she went by. And, and she's waving, hey, she's so happy to see me. Because that's why she pulled up real close to make sure it was the pastor. Oh, yeah, it's Pastor Mike. I can tell the back of his head. And she was happy, so she got right up close to where she could see. And she's waving. <laughs> and as she goes by, I'm shaking my fist. One way, sister. God bless you, <laughs> bruh. You know, I get to church, and the, God convicted me. I, I came, and she goes, oh, I'm so happy to see you, Pastor. And I'm glad you recognized me, too. You gave me the one-way sign as, as you went by. And, and, oh, man, that was so cool to see each other on the 49 coming up here and just pray for one another. And, yeah, and she laid it on, and it was the Lord laid it on. And finally, I had to say to her sister, what a hypocrite I am. And I was shaking my fist at you, and then I recognized who you were. I, I put my finger up like, one way, Jesus. I could have stumbled her with my anger. We don't live our lives for ourselves. Jesus didn't live his life for himself. We live our lives in relationship to one another. We esteem others more important than ourselves. And we would never do anything that would cause another brother to stumble with our actions, with our attitude, with our words, with our practices. The weakest in the body, their faith becomes the standard. We may have faith, we may have knowledge that there's nothing wrong with some of the things that we're doing in moderation as one of our liberties, but if it causes a brother to stumble, beware, Paul would say. Watch as he moves to the text. He says, and though through thy knowledge the weaker brother perishes from whom Christ died. And watch what he says in verse 12. But when you sin, do you know the Bible calls that sin? 
This is the first time sin is mentioned in the chapter. It's mentioned in regards to the one who would practice their Christian liberty to the detriment of somebody else. True story, when I was a youth pastor, I was out riding my dirt bike with a bunch of the guys, and I didn't have time on Saturday night when I got in to unload the, the, the bike out of the back of my truck, so I just went to church um, the next Sunday morning with my dirt bike in the back of my truck, and one of the guys came up to me, whose son was in our youth group, and said, what are you doing with that murder cycle in the back of your truck? I go, what are you talking about? He goes, your murder cycle. My son's been wanting one of those things, and I told him he's not getting one of those things, and here you as the youth pastor show up with one in the back of your truck. That offends me. I never brought that motorcycle to church ever again. No matter how late I got in on a Saturday, because Saturday was my day off, Riding my dirt bike, that was my form of exercise. I made sure it was out of the back of that truck because I didn't want to stumble him. Not that a motorcycle, there's no place in the Bible, but I didn't want him to have an attitude toward me. Now, I have friends that have real problem with guns. I like shooting them. They don't want to be around them. Christian friends. And when I go camping... I don't take guns when I go with them because I don't want to stumble them. I had one friend at the last church I pastored who his son shot himself to death. Didn't want anything to do with guns. So whenever I went camping with this man, man, that my gun stayed home. Never brought up the subject. Never talked about hunting around him. Never talked about shooting around him. Never talked about my latest purchase. Never would because I didn't want to stumble that brother. Let this mind be in you, which was also found in Christ Jesus, who gave away everything and paid a horrible price to have fellowship with you and me. Esteem others as Jesus did better than yourself. Look not every man to his own concerns, but to the concerns of others. Because if you exercise your liberty to the hurt of some weaker Christian's faith and their conscience, the Bible says you have so sinned against Christ. Wherefore, if meat, here's Paul saying this, if meat make my brother to offend. And, and listen, and there's no prohibition. In fact, the Bible says if it moves, you can eat it in the New Testament. And I've eaten some pretty weird things out camping. You know, in fact, we, we went to Belize. We, we're starting a work down there, and we go to this pastor's house, and he was so happy because meat was a rarity and he was going to serve us meat with our meal. And when we get there, we find out the meat that he is serving us is royal rat. That's what they call it. In fact, when the queen of England used to visit Belize because it's a British colony, that's the meal she loved was this royal rat. It's really called a gibnet, but it's a rodent. It's a big rodent. And so he was serving us rodent and I'm looking at the rest of the team, and they're looking at me like, what do we do? Well, we eat it. That's what we do. Because we don't want to offend this guy. And the interesting thing is he had some meat and some broth, and then right in the middle of the bowl was floating this big square thing. And it was just a big hunk of fat. And uh, so I'm looking at one of the other guys on the team that's with us. and So I picked it up, and I gave him an example. This brother provided for us a meal that cost him. And I wouldn't offend him for anything. I put that big hunk of fat right in my mouth and let it slither right down my throat. And when it hit the bottom, I was hoping it wouldn't come up. And I ate that rat. <laughs> because I wouldn't offend my brother. First time we went to Africa, true story. We had the team there, and, and they were going to feed us after I got done speaking. And, and I spoke for about an hour, maybe an hour and 15 minutes. And when I got done, the guy comes up to the stage and says, well, thank you for that short message, Pastor. It was really good, but a little on the short side. And I'm thinking, wow, I like this church. And then all of the congregation watched as they served us. Hot Pepsi in this meal. 
And I look on my plate, and they had taken a cube square out of the back of a pig. So you had meat, fat, hide, hair. There's two big hunks sitting there. I don't want to offend these people. They're all watching. They're not going to eat until I eat. So I picked the hide, the hair, the fat, the meat up, put it in my mouth, and chewed a little bit and swallowed it. All those people are freaked out. They're watching me. I'm going, I wonder why they're watching me. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not offending them. I'm going to eat what they put in front of me because I wouldn't do anything to offend them. I, I know that this is probably the best meal that they're ever going to have during the day. And I, I, I know that they, at a big expense, they brought this for me and for the team. One lady, she acted like she was going to eat it and dropped it into her purse <laughs> on our team. And so at the end of it, one of the Africans come up and says, man, you know, wow, you Americans, you don't waste anything, do you? And I go, well, what do you mean? And then, well, because he was talking to an interpreter, he goes, well, we just use the hair for a handle, and we just eat the meat and some of the fat. We don't eat the hide and the hair. <laughs> uh, it was amazing to us to watch you eat the hide, the hair, the everything. You, you Americans don't waste anything. <laughs> I wouldn't offend you for the world. <laughs> Not my conscience, yours not my desire, yours. Not my will, his. Let this mind be in you. Now, I never ate the hair again. <laughs> the next time they offered the meal, I, I realized what the hair was for. It was a handle, and, and I know that you just eat as much fat and meat as you want, and you leave the hide and the hair behind, <laughs> and you s put it down with hot Pepsi, but listen to the principle. I know we just, but listen to the principle. He, 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 we're called to be servants. We're called to serve the Lord and to serve one another. We're called to esteem others better than ourselves. We're called, listen, to put others' needs above our needs. To look not to our own need, but to the needs of others, even above our own needs. Now listen to what he says in Matthew as we close out this chapter. Matthew chapter 25, verse 11. Here it is. But he that is greatest among you, Jesus says, shall be the servant, shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself, the one who's puffed up in his knowledge and his pride is going to say, I've got entitlements and I've got rights, he will be abased. But those who humble themselves shall be exalted. Mark writes in the 10th chapter, the 45th verse, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. What's the principle that Paul is preaching in the 8th chapter? It's not about meat. It's not about idols. It's about attitude. And Paul is saying we should live our lives in such a way that the things that we do and the way we speak and the places we go and the actions we commit would never stumble, not even the weakest brother in the faith. But that our example would be one of love and esteem and care as a servant. As Christ cared for us, we would care for one another. Amen? Because the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, meekness, self-control of such against there is no law and they that are Christ have crucified their passions and their affections. Amen? Now, I want to read before we, we're, we're almost done. I want to just read through these uh, 13 verses again in context and listen to the commentary that we gave on it and then we'll have communion. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. But knowledge puffeth up and love builds up. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. As concerning, therefore, eating those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing. It's nothing in the world that there is none other God but one. For though there be many called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, they that are called gods many and lords many, but to us there be but one God, 
the Father in whom are all things, and we in him. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we in him. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge, for some with conscience of idols unto this very hour eats the thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat are we the worse. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to them that are weak. Be careful. For if any man see thee which hath knowledge set at the meat in the idol's temple, shall he not his conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? Is not your, the way you live emboldening him to do something he probably shouldn't do? And through that knowledge shall your weaker brother perish for whom Christ died. But when you sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if meat make my brother to offend. Here's the heart of a servant. Paul would say, I would not eat meat while the world turns. Lest I cause my brother to be offended. Others center. Esteem others better than yourself. Do nothing that will cause your brother to stumble. Even if you can do it in faith, consider the weaker Christian and their attitude and their conscience. Amen? 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 Amen. Amen. Okay, let's get the worship team up. Get the ushers up as well and we'll have communion this morning. What a wonderful example of this we have in Jesus. Amen? 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 Amen. Just don't go to sleep yet. Let's all stand if you can. Let me ask you this as the ushers are coming up and the worship team is getting ready to lead us in worship. You know, when we're going through that section, and it's a rough section, there's only 13 verses, it's one chapter, we got through it in one setting. Let me ask you this, how many, and listen, this is important, how many did the Lord speak to you about something you're doing that could hurt somebody else? Yeah. Um, could hinder their faith. Could embolden their weak conscience to do something that could be detrimental to their spiritual growth. I would encourage you today to take that before the Lord. Because I'll give you an example of this. When I first got saved, the, the, there was an elder in our church whose wife took a bunch of his stray kids in. And about the third Sunday we were in church, he invited us over for a Sunday meal. Now, I, I just was delivered of alcohol and drugs. God delivered me. He spoke very clear to, clearly to me. Coming down from that Bible study tonight, I gave my life to the Lord and said, if you go back, you'll never make it out. But I had no withdrawals, none of that. It was just gone. And I threw all the stuff out the window on the way down from the Bible study. Um, I was an alcoholic, no, no two ways about it. Mad Dog 2020, Switch Malt, Liquor, Chaser. That was my high school cocktail, along with the uppers and the downers and all the other drugs to keep me moving. I go to their house, and this elder that I respected so much looked at me and said, do you want a glass of wine with your meal? I said, no, sir. I don't. And I got to go. I got to leave. What's wrong? I'll talk to you about it later, but I can't be here right now. And I left. And I said, Lord, what do I do? I love these people, but how can he drink alcohol? He's an elder. It destroyed me. You rescued me from it. He said, you got to go talk to him. And so I called up Jim, and I said, Jim, I know you work in Chico. Can I, I, can I buy you lunch? I need to talk to you about something, man. And I went there and I said, listen, I'm not trying to judge. But why in the world would you offer me wine? He goes, what do you mean? I said, God delivered me from that. It ruined my life. It wrecked me. 
God saved me. And now I'm in your house and you're an elder of the church and you are offering me the very thing that destroyed me. Why would you do that? Tears came in his eyes. He said, I've never had a clue. I am so sorry. I would never do that again. You see, be careful, Christian. Be careful, Christian. In the words that you speak and the things that you do and the liberties you allow into your life, be careful, Christian, that it don't hurt somebody else. We're to be others-centered. I'm so afraid of drugs and alcohol that when I had kidney stones and I was in the hospital, and they tried to give me the pain medication and I vomited out the morphine and it gave me something else. I called for the elder and said, you need to be here. You need to read scripture. You need to be praying for me. This terrifies me. This terrifies me. And there are brothers and sisters in this fellowship that God called you out of that, didn't they? Didn't he? And you don't want to stumble back into it. Be others centered. Think. And lay aside those things, man, that would cause others to stumble. Amen. Father, help us to be your servants. Help us, Lord Jesus. This message was not meant to be negative, but Lord, it's it's one of those messages that's hard hitting. Because it talks about a life that is willing to surrender for the betterment of others, to let go of things in our life that could be stumbling blocks for others, Lord, and help us to live that way. Because certainly you're our example. Look what you were willing to let go of to come and minister to us. So Lord, help us, Father, we pray. Help us, Lord Jesus, we ask to be free of any offense, to never Allow anything into our lives that would cause another to stumble. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And now, Lord, we ask for your blessing upon the communion table, Lord, as it's being distributed. Hold it in a few moments. We'll eat and drink together. But, Lord, thank you for being our example of love and of grace, of mercy, of servanthood. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Let's worship as the cup and the bread are being distributed.
song. Listen, every one of you, I want you to look at your neighbor and tell them, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, they are forgiven. Amen. This will help me with marriage counseling. Wives, look at your husband and say, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Husband, tell your wives the same thing. Tell your neighbor. You can say, not because you're deserving of it, but because God is merciful. If you want, you can say that too. Because <laughs> God is merciful. And Jesus is our example, is he not? As I have loved you, Jesus would say. <coughs> and this is evidence of it. So love one another. As I was willing to strip myself of all reputation, honor, glory, and power, take on the form of a servant and serve you, serve one another. Amen? Because the greatest evidence that you're a follower of Christ is that you love. Jesus said, this is the sign. Not that you can quote the Bible from Genesis or Revelation. Not that you have every doctrinal you know, theme down, solid, and pat. But that the Holy Spirit has such control over you that what exudes from you is love. And you do nothing to offend another brother. Amen. Father, thank you this morning for the blood and for the bread, your body broken for us. As we eat it this morning, Father, and as we drink this morning, may it strengthen us May we be reminded of at least three things this morning. Number one, our sins are forgiven. Number two, you love us. No greater love hath any man than he laid down his life for a friend. And you call us your friend. And number three, Lord, as we eat from the common loaf, may we love one another as you have loved us. And we pray these things this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. Let's eat and drink together. Well, you know, there's only one song. <laughs> I think we're going to sing this one in heaven. You know, if we had to pay royalties to the guy that wrote this song, he'd be rich yeah. every time we <laughs> sang it. River. 
I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands, for I will only sing of when your love came down. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. Again, as we close out the service this morning, <clears throat> I'm getting a fog in my throat. I want to pray for those that are homesick, battling with the head cold and the flu that's going around. Lord, just again, Lord, I would pray that your healing hand would be upon them. And Lord, for us this morning, may we get it. May we understand it. You've called us to servanthood to lay down our entitlements and our rights, our privileges, our liberties, and serve one another. Even if it costs us, Lord, to be willing to put another's needs above our own, as you did for us, Jesus. Help us to live like that. I think there's no greater form of worship, there's no greater show of a respect to our Father, then we emulate His Son and be like Jesus. And so, Father, help us to do that, we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus, we ask. All God's kids would say, Amen. 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 If you need prayer, we'll be up here to pray with you and for you. If not, you're dismissed the fellowship or head on out if you need to.